It's time for Supply Chain Now, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Hey, on today's episode, we are continuing Logistics with Purpose, one of our favorite series here, powered by our dear friends over at Vector Global Logistics. On this series, as hopefully you've come to know, we spotlight leaders and organizations that are changing the world in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, you know, we work hard to increase your supply chain IQ. Hopefully you'll, you'll pick up on that through this conversation here today. Uh, with no further ado, I want to welcome in my esteemed co-host here today. We've got Greg White, serial supply chain tech entrepreneur and trusted advisor. Greg, good morning. Howdy. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Great week. Great week. We'll talk more about that. And then, of course, Enrique Alvarez, our MVP, uh, Managing Director at, at Vector Global Logistics. Enrique, how are you doing? Good morning. Hey, Scott, Greg. Hey. Greg. Great to be here with you guys, and I'm excited about this particular episode. We yeah. are, too. I had, to, I had to continue the baseball analogies based on the, <laughs> on, on the pre-show conversation, so we're hoping, we're keeping our fingers crossed that we're going to see at least 60 games of baseball on our Braves here. Um, I want to welcome in. Uh, our, our featured guest here today, Joel Manby, CEO to major corporations over the last 25 years, current chairman of Orange, which is a powerful nonprofit working in over 40 countries. We're going to learn more about that. And uh, author of the popular book, Love Works, which we're going to dive into that too. Good morning, Joel. Good morning. How are you doing, Scott, Enrique, Greg? Good to be here. Yeah, welcome. Good to have me. Great well, to have you here. Yeah, no doubt. L all right. So um, I saw, I saw on your um, your bio that you were CEO at Saab. I, I know we want to get to that, but I, I just wanted to tell you I saw the most oddly colored Saab nine three, yeah, uh, convertible, kind of a fluorescent yellowish green. Yes, I don't know what years you were there, but um, <laughs> I have fond memories of a of a Saab nine hundred turbo that I had when oh, I was great. in high school. So. Oh, high school, so, you know, a few years ago then. Yeah, a few years <laughs> And Joel, just yeah. in case, Greg is our resident car lover, all things cars. Oh, so great. when Saab hit the notes, Greg's ears perked up. No, I love, I love Saab. I love my time there. And, yeah, I think we sold about five of that color in the entire <laughs> United States. I should have taken a picture. My wife, we were sitting there eating, and she said, that is the ugliest car I've ever seen. <laughs> it is and it was, actually, I, you know, the truth is, when I came in, uh, that was one of the things I did is we cut that color pretty quickly. Um, it was a bad color. I know exactly what you're talking about. Do you really? Okay. <laughs> oh, Man, no. if, it, if, if it made an impression on you, that, that's, it just, that says no, a it lot. Was, it was horrible. And uh, yeah, Saab was a great experience. Great, great car. Very yes. uh, over-engineered maybe, but uh, under-marketed. Yeah, most definitely. Sure. It, it, it was one of the best cars I ever drove, I can tell you. And Everybody loved that the key was in the console. Yeah. Right. It actually came from uh, because uh, in car accidents, when your, if your knees go into the dash, your knees get ripped up. So they, it's a safety feature to put the key uh, between the seats. Yeah. So, kind of thing. Yeah. Between Saab and Volvo, they had all of the safety features pretty much. Yeah. Right. I mean, the yeah, they were Swedes are great with that. For sure. They safe. must be terrible drivers, Joel. That's all I can think. <laughs> You know, they, they hated, uh, they did not want to put cup holders in their vehicles. Like they thought Americans were absolutely nuts. Yep. <laughs> the want Germans to. weren't big fan of that either. No. Yeah. No. You're, you're in the car to drive, not to eat or drink. Well, they don't have to drive nearly as far as we do. I've, I've been to Sweden quite a bit, so it's a little bit different. There. Yeah. No, it is. It's definitely different. But we could say we're more prepared. Um, but hey, let's jump into this. So, Tell us a little bit about you, where you're from, um, you know, a little bit about, about your childhood or any kind of early life memories or, or uh, pivotal moments or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Greg, I, I grew up in Michigan, so uh, Battle Creek, which is the serial capital of the world. Yes. When you were a kid, a lot of, a lot of your listeners, the, the older ones would send in their box tops to uh, Battle Creek, Michigan to get their free toys. 
But um, I actually grew up really poor. Um, you know, a lot of people, and I think your listeners, they look at people who have worked hard and become CEOs or owners or entrepreneurs, and there's some assumption of a golden spoon. But I, I uh, my dad was a failed entrepreneur, and uh, he went out of business in his his, his uh, tractor dealership. And there was a period of time my mom told me after he passed away that we he was bringing home about fifty hours, fifty dollars, fifty dollars a week is all wow. he was bringing home, about two thousand bucks a year, and did that for about seven years and until it went out of business. And it had a huge, huge impact on me. Um, I'm not sure it was all positive because mo most, of the, most of the fights in our family were over money. And so uh, I, I was pretty driven at an early age to, I didn't want that for my family. So it's, it's one of the reasons I wanted to go into business. Although <laughs> on a lighter note, the other reason is because I wanted to be a professional baseball player. And, um, I actually was invited by a scout to go to a tryout camp for the Tigers and wow. for the Cincinnati Reds. And, and yeah, I made the throwing cut and I made the running cut, but then I had to face all the pitchers who were throwing 90 miles an hour plus on the gun. I played division three baseball, you know, and, and so I never saw a 90 mile an hour pass ball. And so I literally stood up at the plate for about five minutes and didn't even fall off a pitch. I, I looked like one of those swing fans. I was just, air was moving. <laughs> and um, so that was the end of my baseball career. And then uh, in high school, I also guarded Magic Johnson, the world famous Hall of Fame basketball player wow. in a high school basketball game. So that's a claim to fame I had. And, wow. and I, held, I held him to 48 points, so. <laughs> Good job, that's outstanding. Yeah, so, that's, so where that's, did you go to high school and college, Joel? So I went to, I went to Battle Creek Lakeview, and okay. then I went to Albion College for undergrad, and I went to Harvard actually for business school. Okay. So um, I was very fortunate, I got into Harvard right out of Albion, and um, I, was, I was actually going to go into law. This is actually an interesting story for listeners about direction you get from mentors. I worked for a lawyer, I was in pre-law, and after working for him, I asked him if he thought I should be a lawyer. And I thought, of course, he was gonna say, yes, you'll be great. And he, without any hesitation, he said, no, you shouldn't be a lawyer. I said, what, what, what? He said, look, lawyers, in your analogy for football, lawyers are like referees, and you are a quarterback. You, you need to lead, you need to be in a business where you're leading other people and that was the best advice I ever I ever got and actually wow. but not ever but uh, very helpful and so then I switched to business and went to went to Harvard and came out and and you know went into business after that so that's a little bit about about my background wow there is a lot there that was quick Joel and but there is a lot there yes um, <laughs> that is a lot of insights it's interesting I was noticing some parallels. It's not about me, but there's a lot of parallels in your early life and my early life. Um, so it's interesting what you take away from that. I can really empathize with, I think, where, with where your, your head is, right? It's not great. You know, it's not necessarily a positive thing. I mean, I, I, I think I've made too many decisions in my life based on what would make the most money. And I mean, jumping kind of to the I've, I've had some really tough up and downs in my life. I mean, two really kind of rock bottom experiences as we walk through, we can, we can hit them if you want, but the mistakes I've made, including why I lost my first marriage was a lot of my just workaholism and just drivenness. And I look back now and wonder why. And I think a lot of it was just fear, you know, fear of failure, fear of not having enough fear of being like my dad, where the money wasn't there and the fights. And, yeah. and I think we, we do a lot based on trying to avoid pain that we saw or experience as children without even knowing it. I'm, I'm 60 years old now, so I'm just kind of realizing some of this stuff later in life. But um, I, I don't say those things with, with pride as much as maybe caution to other people listening to really, really, no matter what, do what you love to do, and the the money takes care of itself. I know that's cliche, but um, that that's certainly my own experience. Yeah, man, that's great insight. Seriously. Yep.
So before we, one quick, uh, on a lighthearted note, I want to go back to baseball for a second. Are you still a big fan of the game? And if so, who, what is your team? And what are the prospects for the 2020 season? <laughs> well, I don't, I haven't been found enough what's happened lately, but I grew up a Tiger fan. So they, they won the World Series. They were actually the first team that came back from three down mm. in a World Series in 1968 against the St. Louis Cardinals. Bob Gibson, Hall of Fame pitcher. Um, and then uh, Kirk Gibson, of course, in 84, yes. won the series. Yeah. The, but they're right now a doormat, which is really tough to watch because they were a powerhouse for so many years. Mm. And the Braves are just so exciting to watch. I just hope we get a season. I just I don't understand why we can't play baseball, yes. even if without fans, the TV revenue. I, I really don't understand um, the fear. But yes. That's a, that's a whole other topic. Well, yeah, the, and the Tigers, when I, when I was growing up, Cecil Fielder, uh, of course, oh, yeah. legendary uh, uh, at the plate. And Jack Morris, who I believe oh, who yeah. killed the Braves in the 91 World Series with the Twins, he, he spent most of his heyday, Hall of Fame career, I believe, with the Tigers, if yeah. my memory serves oh, yeah. well. And he was, on the, he was on the 84 championship team. And yeah. was just, he was powerhouse. I forgot that he beat the Braves when he was oh. with Minnesota. Heartbreaker game seven against John Smoltz in a game that could have gone either way, but we won't. Hey, let's move to uh, some better news. Yeah, this is supposed to be an up topic. <laughs> That's right. I, I have to ask a quick question before Scott, before we move into your segment, just real quick. I can't help but notice that there are musical instruments behind you, and I believe that's a picture of John Lennon. Is that it's, correct? So, well, yeah, actually, <laughs> that is actually a um, photoshopped. That's my. That's me and my two brothers. Whoa! The Beatles album. <laughs> yeah, so, that is awesome. It's John Lennon in the real album, but that's really my brother Josh, and I'm on the far other side, um, and my brother John's in the middle. But wow, yeah, kind of, that's been funny. I didn't even realize that was showing. But um, <laughs> my brothers and I had a rock band growing up, and we were called the Berlin Airlift, and we. Uh, we played in high schools and junior high schools. And, and interesting, when my parents passed, we hadn't played together in 25 years. But my parents passed 10 years ago. And ever since then, we've gotten together at least once a year and recorded covers. And, you know, we usually do Beatles or you know, Eagles or something from the 80s, 60s, and 70s. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's really fun. And really meaningful now because both my brothers have uh, are sick you know they have cancer and so you just never know how much longer they'll be around and so to be able to uh, get with them and play music it's it's one of the great joys of my life that's awesome man yeah great that's question great greg i tell you greg yeah. doesn't miss a thing right enrique he, he's the most observant person on the planet it's this electronic drum set you can play any <laughs> any tone you want on it very cool love now it. what's your, so what do you play Joel? i play i play keyboard and uh and drums in my brother's band i played drums and then i just play keyboard you know, so i'm self-taught i just do it to hack around but i love it i love music mm. and, yeah it's good and the therapy. name berlin airlift yeah that is brilliant <laughs> man yeah. Yeah. i don't t-shirts. think people today would get that reference that's but a good point that, greg but that i mean that's really brilliant for the time that you probably you guys were playing in in high school yeah it was it was we loved it, it was a u- unique name and we actually have all gone to germany and seen where the airlift happened and went to the airport and wow. we're, all, we're all history buffs and mm. yeah the, the americans did an amazing thing there um yep. For the east germans but that's a whole different that's a whole different story yes. but yeah but the cool connection is that is a outstanding supply chain uh success story which oh my gosh. We'll, and we'll have to dive into that in a different episode but uh so joel you're right that was amazing what they yes. brought coal they brought they flew in everything absolutely yeah. The fire it was just amazing it was really uh, you know uh it was an early winter for the air force too which was in its infancy uh when that took place so yeah uh, what a great story um all right, so let's circle back to some other, uh, talking about a great story, your, your, your professional journey. I mean, you're a, a pretty unique guest that we've had here at Supply Chain Now, given, given uh, your stops as CEO at some of these organizations we're going to walk through. But for starters, you spent 20 years in what I would call at least one of the toughest industries, being automotive. Um, you know, I, I was spent a little time in metal stamping that supplied a little bit to automotive and where I lost several years of my life. Uh, and it is a tough business. 
Um, so tell us more though about your role as CEO of Saab Automobile USA. Yeah. Well, let, let me just back up one one step before Saab, and that's Saturn. One of the, one of the greatest moments of enjoyable experience of my life was helping start Saturn. And mm. a lot of the younger listeners may not remember it, but it was a breakthrough car brand. Uh, really became number one in the small car business. It was known for no hassle shopping. And what I really learned there, Scott, was the the importance of defining a brand, even in the really crowded automotive industry. A, a new brand came out in Saturn and really changed the vernacular of an industry. They would call mm -hmm. it Saturnizing a dealership when it was, you know, tr we treated the customer right. We absolutely wanted to treat them with respect and dignity as opposed to most car buying experiences, which is like getting the root canal, right? I mean, it's one of the yeah. worst experiences in your life. And it was a great experience for me because um, it wasn't intended to be that way, but it, it really the innovation was breeded out of necessity because the car wasn't that great. And we knew we had to market it differently mm. because we couldn't beat Japanese on quality at that point. So we beat them in, in the way we treated the customer. And, and that was the first car that really focused, car brand that focused on guest experience. Well, but it was because of Saturn's success. Saturn had a, like I said, kind of a marginal car, but a fantastic dealer network, fantastic marketing. So I drove a 1994 SL2. Did you really? Uh, I did. Uh, it was my first car when I got on station at Shaw Air Force Base. It, it was the first car, car I ever bought on my own. Wow. And I put 125,000 miles plus some on that car, uh, automated, automated seat belts. It was a straight shift and it was a great car. I mean, it was, it was the first thing I felt a lot of ownership on. Uh, and, and so I didn't, you know, I should have done my homework better, but Saturn was a, what a unique story there. And, 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 yeah. and, and you, you, you helped launch the brand. I was one of the first four marketing people. I, you know, I, I was right out of business school. So I was only 26. I had kind of a mid-level uh, management position, but certainly it grew over time. But just to watch it all happen was an amazing experience. And to, to see us pivot and how we were going to market and see how successful that became was just a great experience. But it was because then, then Saab owned, I'm sorry, GM owned half a Saab. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted someone because Saab had an amazing car, but horrible marketing and horrible distribution that they wanted a Saturn person specifically. So that was really a big break in my career in that I was only 35. And so in the General Motors world, that's incredibly young to be a CEO of yeah. Um, like even DeLorean, you know, the fame, I think he was 38, but so it, it takes a while. So that, but that was a break for me because I, I, I received that position so early. And, you know, I think the, the one thing for your listeners that, that I, I was trying to think about a unique aspect of that Saab experience that would be helpful. It's that the, we definitely were innovative and we pivoted away from industry norm and the, 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 the industry norm in the auto industry for retail is just add as many dealers as possible. Just throw them out there. Well, Saab was dueled with all these crummy brands at the time. I shouldn't, I won't mention who they were, but they were always dueled up. They didn't have individual stores like mm -hmm. Lexus or Infinity or BMW. So instead of adding more, we actually, we had a new car coming, the 9.5, brand new sedan. So we knew we had leverage. And so we actually decreased our dealer network, got rid of about a third of the real poor performers. And the, we gave those who would commit to Saab with new buildings, dedicated employees, or at least dedicated employees, even if they didn't build a building, we would loan them money, they had to pay us back. So it was a whole program that we revitalized the whole network in about three years. And mm -hmm. so when we brought the new car out, um, literally the store, the sales per store, doubled from mm. what it was before so now the dealerships were profitable and then they put their best people and so so many times and I, I know in supply chain when i was with general motors it was always they they were so focused on low cost producer or get the lowest price versus making sure the suppliers were successful as well and that's what we we made the dealer successful and that made Saab successful. And mm -hmm. so we did have a really good turnaround, but really put the old thinking 
in the trash can mm. and try to be innovative and, and do it a different way. Love that. And it broke records as you were talking about the sales records. Uh, so them uh, taking the risk kind of, as you put it, of, of a young CEO at 35 really paid off in spades. What um, you shared a lot about what led to some of those record breaking uh, um, sell the, 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 the sales growth, anything else that really sticks out? You kind of, it sounds like you kind of went counter to some of the prevailing norms at the time. Anything else stick out uh, with decisions y'all made at, at yeah, those, those big results? The, the other big thing we did is Saab was near the bottom in guest satisfaction at the dealership level. And so, and also in quality. So we, we the engineers in Sweden did a great job turning that around. We focused a lot on frontline. And what I learned at Saturn, and it's really stuck with me my entire career, whether we talk about theme parks or autos, I'm, I love the guest experience and it's all about the frontline employee. If you don't treat, you know, one key principle, I think for your, your listeners that I've always learned the hard way is the enthusiasm of your guest experience never rises any higher than the enthusiasm of your own employee. And yeah. It sounds straightforward, but man, I cannot believe how many companies I've been involved in as a board member that their focus first is on the dollar. And I think that's the wrong approach. I mean, leadership is a balance between employee results, like your employee scores, your guest results, and your financial results. And let me say it, maybe it's too harsh, but any fool can improve one of those things and put the company in bankruptcy, right? I mean, <laughs> we can give the guest everything they want, we can give the employee everything they want, or we can drive everything to the bottom line and ruin quality and the guests will go away or the employees will quit. The art of leadership is the intersection of all three of those and trying to balance them so that you have a very profitable, thriving business. And a lot of businesses I see don't put enough focus on the end guest score or their, um, their, their own employees, which is really what, you know, when we get to the book and love works, that's what it's all about. And kind of my whole career. <laughs> so I had to sit up because I feel like I'm in school right now. <laughs> Seriously. I, and, and you in the back of the room, pay attention. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I've been taking notes off. the whole time. I'm telling you, man. So I'm like, so I want to, uh, so Joel, you see the reaction you're getting from all three of us. A lot of what you're sharing does, you know, almost stands a hair up on the back of your neck. Uh, and Rick, I want to get you to weigh in here. We haven't heard from you yet. What, based on what Joel, Joel's just, he did drop a lot, a ton of golden knowledge there. <laughs> but what's, what, what sticks out really to you with what he just shared? No, for me, it's just all about the people. I think, uh, I think it's really key to our company, key to what we do. And I think that as Joel was saying, I think if you have highly motivated and uh, empowered uh, employees or even shareholders, they must feel like they belong to something greater than just making money, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's just that having a, a cause and, and using it and leveraging it to not only uh, become successful as a company, but then also to change the world, which is what Vector is set up to do. I think that's key. And, and, and I had a question for you, Joel. I mean, it's amazing what you've been sharing with us and I appreciate for doing it. Uh, it, might, it probably wasn't as, as simple as you put it, uh, convincing an organization to go against what everyone else did at the time. And just how how was it? What was a little bit more of the conflict that you have to uh, undergo to, to, to have people buy into closing dealerships? Because that's something that, again, at the time and sometimes even now goes completely against what any, I guess, average CEO would do, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's a great question. It was interesting, Enrique, the, the tension was more with the, the experienced Saab employees that had been there a long time. The board, I reported to a board, the General Motors board, they were very supportive because it was in bad shape, right? So we had the advantage that Saab was not profitable so that the board was willing to try just about anything. And I knew... I was so committed because I had seen it at Saturn. I saw what happened when people were focused and they, they believed in what they were doing. And I just did not believe in the dueling concept where you'd, a customer would walk in and you know they could buy an Infinity or a Saab in the same dealership. 
it's the water is always going to flow to the most profitable, which was infinity at the time. So I was so committed. I think my belief in it convinced the employees, but, but to your point, I had to put a, I put a five point plan together that was really clear, showed everyone the math of what would happen. That we're going to have a difficult year and a half doing this, but I shared that with everyone in the organization. I had an all employee meeting, went through it in detail, answered questions ad nauseum, and just kept repeating that five point plan and the progress towards it over and over and over again, and kept it simple so that people could see the progress and it was a really really gratifying experience but you're right there was and let's, let's face it enrique um it wasn't all it, we had to let some people go i mean you, right. you, as a leader they have a choice to get on the bus or get off the bus and unfortunately probably about 15 percent or 10 you know 10 or 15 percent of my management team direct reports to me weren't on the bus and we had to make changes. And uh, same thing happened at SeaWorld. You just, I don't like to let people go. I hate it. I hate that part of being a CEO, but um, you know, sometimes it has to happen. Yep. Well, so let's very reluctantly leave the automotive industry. I think <laughs> it, that's a tough industry to leave because there's so much to dive into there. Oh man, but it's so huge. It is. Uh, you, so you later served, and correct me if I, if I mispronounce this, as CEO of, is it Hershend Enterprises? Hershend, yeah, it's Hershend. It's not, it's not the Hershey. It's Hershend. It's just yes. the name of the family that owns it. <laughs> Darn it. Hershen. I'd love yeah. to see what you could do with a chocolate bar, Joel. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So given the large differences between the automotive industry and the theme park slash entertainment industry, you know, what were some of the similar leadership challenges that you had? Well, you know, like Enrique said, uh, it is all about people. And that's, that's the common thing through all leadership. Great leadership is about leading other people. And, and that's a tough job, but it's also a great honor to do so. Um, the similarities were that they're all consumer-based industries. And the front line, the, the employee that's touching the guest, whether it's the salesman in the car dealership or the, you know, the front line person at a theme park, it is a very difficult task to culturally get a common a, a common set of values that they adhere to and they're passionate about, and that's really what I love to do. And it, that was the common thing between them. However, they're very very different in that the car industry is so large that even even as CEO of Saab in the North American market, I still had to interface and understand the global market with the Swedish executives and it was hard to really get your hands around everything. Whereas in the theme park is industry, they're smaller units and you really have a complete control from a creative standpoint. And I hate the word control, but I just love the creativity of whatever your cash flow was in the theme park, you could direct it towards any activity, a ride, mm -hmm. attraction, a show, a theme, a themed event, um, better food. And there were so many options within theme parks um, it's really about a dozen businesses in one, right? You've got food and, and you've got entertainment, safety issues, big rides, huge, huge rides and attractions. So it had a lot of variability to it, which actually made it more complex than people would think. Mm. Uh, so uh, for the sake of time, we're going to keep moving. We're going to talk about SeaWorld in just a second. And I, I know lots of our listeners will, will connect with that story and that brand. But real quick, uh, we had Rick McDonald on a couple of times. He's a senior leader with the Clorox company. Uh, great mm -hmm. interview. Great, great leader. Uh, and in our last appearance, he, he, he shared a couple of stories of his interactions and just his appreciation of his frontline folks, the folks in the plants making it happen during a critical time for the company. For, and really, I mean, not to be too dramatic for the world, especially for their products. You have, uh, throughout just the first half of this interview, have spoken about the front line of spoken about the employee experience and how that's got to be just as important as a customer experience. Could you share, do you think back of an interaction you have with one of your team members, perhaps one on the front line that really sticks out and, and something you still go to mentally? Well, I, absolutely. I, there's so many, but when I, and we may talk about this more later, but I was, uh, I was on a show called undercover boss and we had to go, incognito and work with folks at the front line. And one of them was a, a man named uh, Richard. And he 
was a frontline employee and his house was flooded mm -hmm. in a, a, a flood off of a river and he lived in a pop-up tent because he didn't have insurance on his home. And when we discovered that, he lived for like five months with, with four kids in a pop-up tent, trying to get to work every day and struggling. And so we basically paid as a company, paid $10,000 to redo his bedroom and end up putting another 10,000 in it. And it, it, that experience caused us to launch a foundation called Share It Forward, where the employees would put money in and then we would match it as a company and 100% of that money would go to help employees in need, whether it was an insurance issue or a scholarship for their children. And through that experience, that one experience of helping and seeing the impact on him and then starting a program to help the whole company, it, it was a cultural transformation because people started helping each other. And I think so many companies and organizations spend all their focus giving to outside sources when some of their own employees have huge, huge needs. And so I think it's a big decision to make. It, it's not either or, you can yeah. do both and. But I, I think, boy, like Enrique said too, take care of your employees first mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll be really loyal. So that's one, one that pops the top of my head. That's a huge one. Thanks so much for sharing. And Greg, when you hear share it forward, I know that that resonates with you, especially right yeah. now. I, I mean, that's what this whole series is about, right? Is some companies give back. It's kind of an afterthought with Enrique and a lot of the companies that we and people that we talk about on on this series. They give first, so I just call it giving forward. Mm. So yeah, love it. And that's what we call our program: is share it forward. It's just yeah. the same, that concept. And um, it, it, there's also magic too in the fact that the employee. And I'm not I'm not suggesting everybody do it this way, but there was magic in that the employee started with a dollar and we gave two. And so they had some skin in the game. They right. wanted to see their own fellow employees helped. And um, it was an interesting dynamic there. It really created this spiral upwards of helping mm. each other. And we went through, you know, that was in 07 and 08 when it all collapsed financially. Um, we had to make some really tough decisions. And we, we pulled together as a team. Uh, a lot of the executives all took pay cuts and we did a lot of things so that we didn't have to lay people off. Um, we all took reduced pay, but we got through it. And then boy, afterwards, the, the morale and the scores were really, really strong. So it's just a, a tribute to helping, helping each other. So but Joel, if, if, if you don't mind, I'll reach back to you on that because uh, that seems like a really good idea that, that maybe we could, uh, we could do here at Vector. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, there are some legal issues. You have to have a separate board because you can't give them awards. It'll get taxed if it's, if you don't have a separate board making those decisions, but there's a way to, to do it all. That's not too cumbersome. We, we mm. kept it really administratively light, but it, it still, it still worked really well. I'm happy to talk about it. All right. So as president and CEO of SeaWorld, uh, I'm not sure about Enrique and Greg. I've been there. I, one of my favorite memories as a kid it was when my grandparents, who are no longer with us, rented three houses in a row in New, New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Uh, and they really spoiled us. It was the big gift to all the grandkids. And they put the three families up. And we went to Disney World and Epcot and SeaWorld. Wow. And it was a huge memory as, as, as still today. Uh, and love SeaWorld. So as president and CEO of SeaWorld, uh, what's um, what was one of your favorite aspects of that role, that team, and that experience? I think from a, I could tell a hundred stories, but the thing I loved the most was being part of pivoting the organization out of a desperate, troubled situation. And basically, in a long story short, um, they were a very popular company, popular brand. The entire company built on Shamu, the whale. Right. Um, killer whale but then when blackfish came out which was a, a basically a shockumentary that made SeaWorld look really evil and really bad and it was about three percent truth but a hundred percent effective and it really hurt our company it actually took our sales down about uh, 50 percent at the SeaWorld parks and then you know what that does to a fixed cost organization it just uh, the CEO was fired I was brought in um, you know, layoffs, all the things that go with that. But the satisfying, to your question, 
we pivoted the brand from all being all about animal entertainment, which was not going to be the rising tide in the future. Uh, we, we changed to basically a, a cause driven brand, come to the park and help save the planet. And it, it basically a portion of all proceeds when you come to the park, help with animal causes. And we had always been doing it. We were actually the largest rescue organization uh, for marine mammals in the whole world and, and save more manatees. Than, I mean, manatees would probably be extinct in Florida if it wasn't for SeaWorld. Wow. But no one knew that. We were horrible marketers. So we pivoted the brand and at the same time, you know, had to take care of a lot of tough issues to get our costs in line with the lower revenue. But it, it was turning. Um, and the, as I left, we were up 12%, uh, but kind of had a run in with the board, which was my worst experience. And that's, that's the story in and of itself. But we had an activist investor come in who um, wasn't on the same timeline I was, even though we were I told the board it would take three years, and it did take three years, but he wanted it faster. Mm. I, I thought some of the things he was asking me to do were, were not the correct things to do for the company. So uh, we parted ways. It didn't have a great ending, but it was a blessing because if I had been there through, during this COVID crisis, man, mm. I, I can't imagine what's going on there. But it was a great, satisfying experience to help the company pivot and give life into people who really weren't sure they had a future. And that as a leader, I, I don't think there's anything more gratifying than that. But it, it this, all this gray hair came from C. <laughs> <laughs> so what a, I, I love that. that that's a, a certain element of that organization that uh, was a blind spot for me. So I, I, now I'm gonna dive deeper into that, that pivoting, that, that messaging change is so important. It sounds like to the, to the, to the culture of the organization. Um, all right, so now, right before Greg uh, talk, takes a deeper dive into some of your current projects, I want to pose a question to you. You mentioned, you know, the COVID-19 and the pandemic yeah, and, and this yeah. incredible year uh, of challenge and difficulty. 2020 uh, has it, been on a variety of levels, right? Um, and Enrique and Greg, I want to ask, I'm going to ask both of y'all after we get, hear from Joel about a best practice from you when it comes to leadership during challenging years like this. But Joel... Uh, I'm sure that in in all of your years of leadership, there are plenty of challenging years. You were talking about some of the big changes you made in the automotive industry. Clearly, uh, the Sea World experience that was a that was a very challenging time. Uh, sounds like you had a success story on the other end, though. Um, what do you what stands out during challenging years from a senior leadership standpoint? You know, the the health of the team, morale. Um, what's the best practice that you go to during those challenging times like 2020? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm going to, a couple of them are COVID specific as I think through your question, but um, one, one thing I've learned that sounds simple, but as a, as a leader, we all have a tendency in a crisis that we want to give our employees certainty. We want to, we want to say it's going to be completely okay. We're going to get through this. And that's actually the worst thing we can do because we don't know. And what they want is authenticity. They want, and if we try to pull the wool over their eyes at all, they see it immediately, right? I mean, we all know that. You, you know it as I say it. But what I think instead of certainty, we need to give clarity. And it's a, there's a difference because clarity is, I don't know the answer to that, but here's what I do know. Here's where we're going. Here's how we're going to adapt. And, I, and I, I think that takes some of the pressure off of us. We, we can't be the, the shell answer man all the time. We have to admit that there's things we don't know because we don't, and we don't know where this is headed. And it's scary. I mean, this, this is one of the toughest times, I think, for all of us to lead. It's, it's frightening. And we have to admit that. The other thing, though, is I think that one of the most challenging things is, especially like in COVID or 2007 when everything... You, most companies have to pivot in some way, right? You have to change your business model in this environment. And what's so difficult is to change and look at the vision, which is forward thinking three, five years out. At the same time, you have payroll to meet and you may not meet it. And you've got all these immediate needs. And one of the toughest things is, is having that balance between the two, because a, a leader can seem so tone deaf. If all they're talking about is the future, and how we're going to pivot when the employees know 
you know, we, we, if we don't make a change here, we're out of business or vice versa. You got your nose down so much that you don't change the business model for the future. That's a really tough dynamic. And what I would encourage your leaders to do right now is sometimes we keep all of our structures in place and we try to run the same way. And what I've learned and read to do differently is create create teams for the crisis. So instead of your normal management team for looking to the future, maybe you need a group of young, different thinking people versus the older team and have a lot of diversity in the room, get your most creative people to think about the future and have a special crisis team that might be more the, the people who don't like change as much, who are focused on the day to day and, and give them the task of helping you as the leader make these decisions. Because the other, the, the third, so that's kind of having two teams based on today and the future. The third, the third principle that I, I really, um, I have found is, you know, some people, um, they, they, when, when we get in crisis, we tend to want to control things too much. And leaders want to bring in the reins and when the exact opposite needs to happen, we need to delegate more because we can't move fast enough if we take all the decisions ourselves, especially the bigger the company, the more this is true. You may be able to get away with a small company. So I've seen it so many times where leaders take in the power versus clarifying the decision making and, and delegating so we can move faster. Um, and I, I hope that makes sense, but those are the three big kind of best practices or lessons that I've learned yep. to do big, big changes. Makes a ton of sense to me and appreciate you sharing. Uh, Enrique, let's, let's uh, get your follow-up to that. What's one thing that stands out that Joel shared or what's, what's one of your key principles during tough times? Well, all those three things stand out and I think are, uh, I totally agree with them and just giving, being clear and honest and open and just recognizing that we don't have answers. I think that's key in uh, our particular company. Um, we have a very unique results-based culture, as you guys know, which basically means taking the time and space component out of the equation. So for us, working remotely, for example, was not something that it didn't matter. I mean, we've done it since we started the company. We already work in smaller teams. So for me, I believe the uh, the one key thing that, that, that has been challenging, but I think has been helpful right now during this uh, situation, which is having offices in Mexico and Chile on top of the U.S., it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of things, right? There's a lot of moving parts from the pandemic itself to our leadership and uh, the different governments to, uh, to the racial tensions that we have and inequality. And so it's been, it's been a lot, it's been a long year so far, but I think uh, my answer to your question would be just listening uh, to people. We started uh, with this company wide zoom meetings on Mondays that are just Whoever wants to join, joins. It's not a, wouldn't have a set agenda. It's just, and it's just all about like, how are you guys feeling? Mm -hmm. and, and people literally just talks about someone had like a, a, a delicate grandmother that had coronavirus. Some others start sharing other things. Most of my team are on average younger. So they're all sick and tired of being home. I mean, they want to go out and have fun and party and have drinks. And so it's been, it's been hard for everyone at different levels and, uh, and reflected in different ways. But I feel like if uh, we spend like an hour, sometimes two, depending on how much there is to share. And I think just giving time to share, uh, I think it's been very important. So um, yeah. that's, that's what I would say. You know, I, I think that's really important, Enrique. The, the thing, this part of having, um, it, it's so important to include people. And we're, we have much more quick check-ins because people right. feel isolated so quickly. If they're not included in a Zoom call and they find out about it, then they're thinking, oh, am I in trouble or am I gonna get let go? There's a, a lot of negative thoughts going into people's heads if they're not included like they used to be in it. And so it's really important to make sure you're checking base and, and people who are supposed to be on a call are on the call. And it's, it's a, it makes it much more challenging. Yeah, uh, great point. Sensitive. Great point. Okay. So Greg, if you would share your, you know, one of the best practices you go back to during challenging times, and then sure. you've got the baton as we dive into some of these really cool projects that uh, Joel's up to now. So I'm that foolish person who has started or significantly pivoted three different companies 
in times of crisis. So in 1991, I started my first major company. We were in a major recession at that time. 2001, I started a company in April of 2001, <laughs> a, a services company. Right when the dot-com implosion happened. Dot-com and then 9-11. Yeah. yeah, and we were a services company, right? So we were traveling around the world at the time. Um, and then and then that company pivoted to be technology and software in 2007, 2008. So right as the Great Recession hit. So I've had a lot of opportunity to lead through um, through crisis. And I have to tell you, I don't I, I don't think I did a great job at certain times. Um, a lot of what Joel talked about in terms of of providing clarity and I did. I tried to own the problem. I, I tried to. Um, I tried to shield my people from it, but what I discovered from that and, and have discovered in times of great growth as well is the clarity that Joel talked about, obviously involving your people is, is critical. And to do that, transparency is, is the principle that I have, have applied. It's be clear. I don't know the answer. It's um, be transparent and uh, you know, and say, hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's why we're going to do it. Here's the impact on the upside. And here's the potential impact on the downside. It's just better to let people know anyway. Um, and what I've discovered is the old adage, a friend in need is a friend indeed, is that, that the people who are really with you that are on the bus, Joel obviously has read Good to Great, probably Built to Last as well, I'm sure. Yeah, I love Jim um, yeah. Um, the, the people who are really on the bus are the people who are going to fight with you through that and lean on them and, and let them bring you ideas or counsel you even. And that, that's a hard thing to do. Um, it's a hard thing to, to let your people counsel you, but man, when you do that, it is so satisfying. It's so, um, it, it, it just puts everyone in the same place. It joins you together in a very unique way. It lifts everyone up and it's, and it lifts the leader up, but it also lifts the entire organization up to know that you care enough about them to be that open with them and let them help you through it because they will, they, uh -huh. uh, they really will. Yeah. You know, Jack, Jack Hirschen at Hirschen entertainment, uh, he taught me the, the, the best words employees can hear from their leader is, I need, I need your advice. I need your help with something. And that, it, it just lifts them up. Like you said, mm -hmm. I, I can't agree with you more, Greg. I just think um, we, we think we have to have all the answers and we don't. And um, because we have great employees. And so I, 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 I love, I love what you said. So true. Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately you don't i don't learn these things by knowing no. them <laughs> i learn these things by making the mistake and no, exactly right and, I mean, all three of those things i brought up i learned because i did it wrong two or three yeah. times and trying to pass on the learnings but you're right we learn a lot more through our mistakes than through our successes no doubt i think that's why right now there's uh there's so much uh, opportunity to grow as as society as human beings as just one one world basically mm -hmm. i think there's it's challenging and i know there's uh there's a lot of things that need to be fixed but i feel like it's also a really good opportunity for us to to uh reflect on the things that we've been doing so far and and hopefully we'll come out of this better and again not as companies or individuals or families or just hopefully we're just going to be and become a better uh, society coming out of this. Um, I really trust that's going to be the case. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think, I think if there's anything that I've seen, it's that transparency is more prevalent and Joel, I'm sure more than when you were leading companies at GM. Oh yeah. Um, and, and the right to fail, the right to right. fail the right way. Um, but the right to fail, the right to try and, and, um, and transparency is a key part of that right? You have to have the board or your employees or your customers recognize that we're going to try something and it may not work, but we believe it will work. And here's why. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, so I think those are, those are all things that bode well for society 
in general um, and, and businesses, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Joel, you just relaunched sort of relaunched love works your book, right? right? So can you tell us a little bit about, about what the book is about and, and you know, the relaunch? Of yeah, it? absolutely. So uh, love works in <clears throat> the title itself. I just want your listeners to stay with me for a minute because <laughs> I know the title can, can throw people off and it's basically a leadership book that teaches about the difference of do goals and be goals. And we all have do goals, which is hitting your profit margins, hitting your sales targets. B goals are what kind of leader do we want to be? What kind of person do we want to be? Because there really, it should be no difference between those two things. Mm -hmm. and, and at Hershen and SeaWorld, we took those B goals, those values, and we didn't just put them on a plaque like 90% of the companies do. Only 10% of companies actually put processes behind them to really infiltrate it into the culture. So it, the love in this book is seven words that paraphrase 1 Corinthians 13 out of the Bible, but it's not love the emotion, it's love the verb. The Greeks have four different words for love. We don't have time to get into all that. Americans only have one. So when they hear love, they think emotion, they think romance, they think soft. Mm -hmm. This is not any of those things. It's a verb and it's how you treat people regardless of how you feel about them. And all the things you guys have been talking about on this call, respect and dignity and listening and being transparent, it's all part of those seven words. And it's being patient, kind, trusting, truthful, unselfish, forgiving, and dedicated. And, and we actually taught our leaders these words and we put behaviors with them and we measured them. We actually, in the review process, you weren't just measured on your do goals, you were also measured on your be goals. And for anyone who wants to establish a strong culture, that I, I believe needs to be done because so many people, again, they put it on the wall, but there's nothing else that reinforces those cultures or it's entirely driven by the personality of the top leader. That works as long as that leader's there, but you know, as you buy companies and right. spread out your organization, that culture needs to be put into all these other divisions. And, and that's really what the book is about, is loving, caring, servant leadership, but it, it also gets business results. And um, you know, I'll just give one anecdote on it. This is a terrible stat, Greg, but 30 only, the, Gallup has measured employee satisfaction, employee engagement for about 50 years. The average score, of the top score in engagement is only ha happening 30% of the time. So only 30% of employees are fully engaged in the work. And it's been pretty consistent for 50 years. It's actually a little better now. But when Hershen would go in or see, well, we put these, these principles in place, our engagement scores would go over 60 to 70, sometimes even 80% over a three year period. It takes some time, yep. it doesn't happen overnight, but it's, it really does also get business results. It's not the reason to do it, but it's a result of it. And um, I updated it because I wanted to put in some of the lessons from SeaWorld. I also wanted to share some of my, you know, a lot of personal failure and some of the learnings um, since I wrote the first book. But I, I feel a calling now with whatever years I'm left, I have left on this earth to try to help other leaders see this way of leadership. Because I don't, one thing I learned in, in early on when I was at Hershen, I had an, for 20 years when I was in the auto industry, I had this angst inside of me. I, I felt like there has to be a better way to lead. I didn't have great modeling in the auto industry. It was you guys know it, it's autocratic, it's fear, yeah. at least it used to be. It wasn't until I got at Hershen that I saw this type of leadership and how successful it was. And I said, this is the answer. This is what I've been looking for. Um, and then when I was an undercover boss and that show was in front of 20 million people after the NCAA quarterfinals, 20 million people watched that show. I was just inundated with emails and letters and cards saying, we want to work in a company like this, that that's when I decided to write that book to, to try to help other people see 
You don't have to be a jerk to be successful, but you, you, you can get great results and treat people the way you want to be treated. And I know on one hand, it sounds like common sense, but I, I realized after getting inundated from America uh, after that show that a lot of people feel that way. They feel undervalued, they feel underappreciated, and they don't understand how they fit into the total formula at the company or heck, these principles work in the home too. So that is what Love Works is all about. And that's why I rewrote the book. Wow. Um, yeah, very so powerful. A couple of, yeah, wow. Uh, again, I feel like I'm in school here. First of all, I have to say, I can see why you have been the CEO of so many organizations. And I have a feeling that you get that offer frequently and probably will after this show <laughs> as well. So I don't want to do fight it the urge, Joel. Don't do it again. No, I want to keep whatever hair I have. Left. There you go. Um, and secondly, it's interesting the way that you approach um, love because it, it's, it's true. There are four words in Greek for it. And one of the things that we have taught our three daughters is, and if you ask any of them, they will say this about that word, about love. Love is an action word, right? right? You don't fall into love. You don't fall in love. You kick and scratch and bite and claw your way to be, to give love, right? right? And, and I think when people recognize that it is more action than emotion, you know, as we talk about changing society, that's, that's what the kind of thing that we need for business, yeah. for, you know, for personal life and for society is you have to recognize, um, somebody said, um, love, this is also biblical. It's, um, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And right. one of the, one of the people that went to my church had a very simple analogy. You know, he said, would you leave yourself sitting on the side of the road with a flat tire? Right. That's, I mean, that is the essence of what love is. And that is the essence of loving your neighbor, of loving someone as much as you love yourself is give them everything that you would give yourself. So, um, and I think that you exemplify that spirit. Um, so you, so I really appreciate, first of all, you resurfacing the book and putting some of your learnings. You are an, a great example of transparency and, and giving. So let's talk a little bit too about uh, this philanthropic organization, Orange, that you're working with today. Tell us a little bit about that organization and how, you know, what, what it is you do and, yep. um, you know, the cause and that sort of thing. Well, I appreciate the words on love. You know, I think before we go to Orange, it, it, if we had a, just a touch of that in politics today, or in the race issue, it's it's not that it's not that difficult. Mm -hmm. But we we have stopped listening to each other, and unfortunately, social media and the way we do things today it's all sound bites, yeah. and we don't have dialogue enough anymore. It's monologue, right. monologue, 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 and hate if you don't think the way I do, and that we have to dialogue. And these, in, these issues we're talking about, whether it's race or COVID, they're complex issues. They take discussion and sound bites just drive me nuts because they, they make it so simple and it's not. But, yeah. um, you know, Orange is a great, great uh, thing in my life. Um, I've actually been chairman of it since the beginning. And, and it was, found, it was I, I'm chairman and the CEO, Reggie Joyner, um, he's built it. And we basically sell and service curriculum to churches. So all over the world, we have 8,000 um, customers in 42 countries. Um, it's gone from you know one church to now, well, actually it's over 10,000 now uh, churches. And I, I love it because it, it it's all values-based stuff. So we have a value per month, good values that, you know, whether you're a, a person of faith or not, there's still great values to teach your children. And that's, that's what I'm spending my, some of my time on, just helping them get through growing pains um, as, as an organization and uh, kind of get going from that entrepreneurial leader to having a transition to the future. So that's, that's where I'm working. But, I, but my, my real calling where I feel led is, is teaching love as a leadership principle. And I do that at Orange. Um, we're putting that in place there as well as with other organizations. So you're the chairman, but you're 
pretty actively involved there, right? So can you tell, yeah. can you tell um, us a little bit about? Right now, I'm also a interim head of marketing, but I'm just helping them get, get some new processes in place. And we're, we're putting a new person in place there because that's just temporary. But I'm, um, I'm really involved with Reggie and, and helping. It's, it's a really tough transition for an organization to go from about you know, 150 employees and now we're headed towards 300. And we just need to, we need to help in the processes and systems that, that make it function outside of just one entrepreneurial leader. And that's a tough transition for any organization, but that's, that's really my main thing that I'm, I'm helping with. Yeah, that there are lots of those sort of ceilings that any kind of company, any kind of organization hits and they need, you're making me think of a friend of mine, Eric Perkins, who lives in Flint, Michigan. Oh, wow. Um, and, um, they have this thing. We, in fact, we were just talking about it. Scott and I were just talking about it called the entrepreneurial operating system. And it, it is a very, um, it's, it's a very organized way of getting companies to kind of break through those glass ceilings. And a lot of it is about transparency and, and communication and that sort of thing. So and trust. Yeah. There just has to be trust. And, yeah, uh, exactly. And usually that this is an interesting analogy. Um, usually there's a, a visionary and they're surrounded, they surround themselves with operators to get what they want done. Right. But, but then they tend to not like the process people or the, what I would call the synergizer who kind of wants to get the best solution, not just what the visionary wants. Right. That they tend to kind of throw out those people in the beginning, but diversity is not just diversity of color or race or gender it's it's a diversity of thinking as well yeah. right we need to surround ourselves with process people if we're visionaries or creatives and that's a that sounds obvious but it's really tough to do because the visionaries really don't want those people around and um they're dream killers right yeah, they're seen as dream killers yes but they're really they're not. really facilitators yeah that's right yeah and yeah, they're the ones it's that difficult. make them real yeah, yeah that's right i mean they're the ones who, you know, I, I've had that. I'm a, I'm a visionary. I am the, let's go take that hill, right? Yeah. And I need that person that says, hey, don't forget your boots and packs and guns, boys. Right? <laughs> so. Well, it's, it's really, and there's a really good TED Talk for this. Um, they are the ones that are uh, usually the, the ones that convert the lone knot into a leader. Without those people, then it will always be just this long lone knot with this crazy idea. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. You need someone to put that to ground, right? So, yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, I, I, I had a quick question, Greg. Yeah, if you go don't ahead, mind, for for Joel. Um, so, Joel, uh, for we have a lot of uh, listeners and, and some good friends that are trying to to keep forward, and, and as Greg was saying it, and um, and. What are you, you lead Orange, who's a great organization. Uh, what are some of the challenges? What could you tell to this visionaries, entrepreneurs, people that are really trying to change the world out there, people that are really working and their main dri they're driven by, by making a positive impact in the world? What would be a couple of like suggestions? And I'm sure that they can also buy your book and there's going to be tons of uh, opportunities to, to, to learn there. But uh, if you could just summarize it, what, what would you tell to non-for-profits right now? Because I'm sure they're really, really struggling with everything that's going on. Yeah. You know, I, it's going to sound cliche and repetitive maybe, but it's just who, it's just what I'm about and what I believe is that the best place to start is with yourself and then the employees around you get healthy because I, I, this is a tough time and, and it's tough. We, we are tough on ourselves. We're making mistakes. We're not sure. So get rest and make sure you're healthy because the mistakes I've made in my life that are big mistakes is because I wasn't healthy. Either I was not sleeping enough or drinking too much because of the stress or coping mechanisms, whatever your coping mechanism is. And those are dark moments in my life that I, I regret. And so sometimes we want to change the world and we're so focused on that versus, man, just take care of yourself first, then take care of your employees and, and then make sure that survives. 
and stay as healthy and then worry about the rest. Cause in some ways, and I, it sounds selfish, but we have to, sh we have to shrink in and make sure those around us survive. Um, because let's face it, man, it's just not, this is, these are tough times. The mental health issues, suicide rates, you know, suicide hotlines are 200% up. Um, we just have to make sure we help those around us. And, and um, if everyone's doing that, the world will take care of right. itself, right? Right. But right, yeah. you know, to your point, Joel, um, uh, uh, we spoke earlier this week on a separate podcast series focused on veterans, and, and we spoke with a wonderful leader um, that lost her husband, a Navy SEAL, back in 2010. And one of the big takeaways for me from this conversation and from someone that's had this tremendous amount of grief and tragedy, and she's been able to redirect it and then help a ton of other people. And one of the key things she said is, hey, you've got to take time to make sure yourself, you're in a good spot so that then you can be in position to help a lot of other folks. And, exactly. you know, in the veteran community, a lot of folks, one of the challenges we have is, is that you don't want to admit anything's wrong because you don't want that stigma or whatever it is. And, but, but there's so much, there, there's an application, there's a, a transfer there, I, I believe, to the, the you know, senior leadership in the private sector where you also don't want to share if, 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 if there's something wrong and, yeah, and exactly. get help man. get yeah. seek counseling. I mean, I, ever since, you know, I, I went through my dark periods in life. I've, i see a counselor every month and therapist to just make sure I don't go off the ledge again. And, um, that's, that's part of the book. I, I didn't go into that, but part of the redo is just the, I had a really tough personal situation at Etsy world. And, um, that's when I also went through the divorce. So just going, I was, you know, going through that trans transition was really, really difficult. And so, um, I didn't take care of myself enough. Mm. I should have. So I, I think it's great lesson for all the leaders right now is we have to forgive ourselves first mm. because we're going to make mistakes. Um, and then worry about those around us. Such a, 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 a key takeaway for our listeners. I mean, that you, a lot of what you've shared here, I, I've got, again, 17 pages of notes, Greg, that seems to be kind of our, our, our status quo here, but yeah. so much, I love how real and authentic uh, the story and experiences you share, Joel, and we're going to have to bring you back because we can't get enough into this first hour. But yeah. one of the last questions we want to ask you, and Enrique, I know you're always curious as we kind of expand the conversation, but let's, um, but let's see what else is on Joel's mind here, business-wise. Yes, no. Um, so, Joel, again, we've talked a little bit or actually a lot about, like, what's going on these days and uh, how many different moving parts uh, there are out there. And, of course, one of the main things that you mentioned, and I totally agree with you, is just take care of yourself first. But what kind of other indicators in the large-scale supply chains are you kind of keeping track of right now? I mean, what what worries you? What What's some of the things that, with everything that's going on, you're – trying to to be more aware of yeah it, we talked about a little of this uh, bef before we hit record button but you know the the interesting thing about supply logistics is you don't notice it until it's really it's, it's messed up and it's right it's like the goalie analogy right you don't notice the goalie until he lets he lets the ball through and, and uh, the goal is scored the i have just noticed it's fascinating to watch all the businesses and how they're adapting and you go into food chains and they've changed their menus and they're out of this and out of that. I, I just, I'm, I'm fascinated by it and it makes me appreciate so much what all of your listeners do, what you guys do for a living basically. And it just makes me admire it um, because I notice now how, how messed up the chains can be right now. Um, from a big picture standpoint though, I, what I'm really focused on, I, I am afraid of what's happening if we don't apply learning to it and love to it, especially with the race issues and COVID. I, I also think we, we can't be fearful. <clears throat> with COVID, I, I feel like the information is not accurate. I mean, we're not getting the uh -huh. full information. Um, it's causing a lot of fear that I think, is, I personally feel is unnecessary if you look at the real data, um, but because the, the press is it has a fear-based approach or a drama-based approach. I think we're making decisions out of fear. And I just want, I want to get back to being proactive again as a country 
and being aggressive because we need to look at the negatives of of not reopening the you know the the unemployment the abuse at home the suicide rates all the negative things we have to be conscious of that so what i'm paying attention to is just trying to get the facts right and communicate that to other people so we can move in a positive direction and not a fear based direction and let's and, and you know let's do that by having a dialogue like you were saying earlier joel i think the last a real thing dialogue yeah. yeah a real dialogue the last thing our country and, and really global society needs is one more thing to divide us it's there's smart people all around this whole discussion that can all embrace the facts and then have a meaningful dialogue without um casting stones and making um uh demagogues out of folks you yeah. know let's get back to love does work uh, does. love does work so it really does work and yeah you know, let's trust each other and let's talk about it let's be truthful and and not be fear-based absolutely okay what you know um i am so glad that enrique and and vector uh the global logistics helped connect us with you joel because this has been at least from my perspective a fascinating and a real conversation with a senior leader that's been there and done it and you don't hear with joel and, and enrique and greg check me you don't hear a lot of the same lip service that that you hear with a lot of senior executives i mean you're getting the full story the good the bad and and some of the ugly um so thanks so much joel for your time with yeah. us Let's make sure folks know how to connect with you, though. How, how can folks learn more about uh, the book and about Orange and connect with your story? Yeah. So for, for the, the book and Love Works, it's really just joelmanby.com. And, and if, if you, you can buy it on Amazon, obviously, or Audible. But if you go there, there is a three-part series on leading through a crisis, like a video series that you can get that I've recorded. Some of the things you've heard here today, but expand on all that. So it's joelmanby.com. And the books love works and then uh, orange is is thinkorange.com um, and it's primarily a church-based organization but if anybody's interested certainly uh, we take donations there if they're interested but um, uh, joelmamby.com is probably the primary one outstanding uh, we've been talking with joel Mamby, current chairman of orange powerful nonprofit, as he just mentioned there in 40 countries helping churches and, and helping a ton of people uh, you got to check out the book to our audience, Love Works. You can find out more information uh, about that at joelmanby.com. Hey, before we sign off, Enrique and Greg and Joel, thanks again for your time and your perspective. This is going to be a tough question. This is going to be the trillion dollar most challenging question Enrique and Greg gets all day. What's your favorite thing, your most powerful thing that Joel shared here today that you're going to take this into oh, your man. next <laughs> 10 conversations? Uh, Enrique, wow. why don't you go first? Uh, yes, sure. Why don't you let me go first, Scott? <laughs> Give Greg some time to to digest I, I know, everything that Joel said. If you want said. me to go first, I will. No, I. Uh, so the one thing. So I I take tons of things, and literally, these are my notes uh, from today. Uh, some of them I have some action items. Uh, one thing that uh, that I think is incredibly powerful and resonated with me the most, and I when I hear it, I kind of make a note, put my name behind, around it, and it just. <laughs> The, the employee matching, uh, helping employees and with each other, I, I, I literally will come back to you, Joel, with more questions about how to set that up. Because I really believe that if you let uh, people, part of the team, help each other out and then you have the company supporting that, it just reinforces what we're trying to do, which is we're all in this together, right? And, and by this, I don't mean vector, it's just life. And I think it's a really, really good reflection of uh, some of the other things that, that you all mentioned. So for me, it, it will be that. I think uh, yeah, empowering people to help other people and, and just being part of that. Yeah. It's tough to narrow it down just one. That, that's the challenge. It is challenge tough. Here. Yes. <laughs> that is a challenging question. Greg, you, you kind of already had your mind made up. Please share. Yeah. Um, love is an action word. I, I, that's so clear he's joel is the first person i've ever heard I, I know there are lots of people who think and say that but he's the first person i've ever heard actually express it that way um and and the clarity right when, when in a time of crisis leading through crisis lead with clarity be open be transparent yeah. um, share and engage your team and um yeah that's it yeah. I which feel like I've said a lot yours, on Scott? this show, uh, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, 
I, I think two things, and there's so much here, but, but number one, the importance of dialogue, the importance that, that it's okay to disagree, uh, that we got to get back to that. That's a huge, not just supply chain, uh, business, the world, and, and being dramatic, they can learn from that if they, if they put it in action. Right. And then secondly, uh, as we've seen here once again, uh, some, you know, there's a sliver of senior leaders that know and it, know how important it is to be open and share and, and share transparently, again, the stuff that, that hasn't gone gone well and, and, and how folks there's so many people that can learn from from what didn't go well I mean, there's so much went well with with joel's pro journey that we talked about but then some of the biggest lessons learned that he shared that we we can all learn from is when the things didn't work out and and you got to be okay and confident with yourself to be able to share those uh those chapters and that, that's uh so joel Thanks so much for your approach with this interview. Um, I, I, I hopefully folks enjoy it as much as we have. Uh, I know that that selfishly, this is one of the highlights of our week. And we had a pretty <laughs> powerful conversation yesterday, Greg, on race and industry. Uh, so this has been a big week of learning uh, yeah. and, and development from a leadership standpoint, at least from where I sit. Yeah, sure. no doubt. Thank no you, no Joel. And I learned that I learned that Joel is smart enough to put his books on Audible. For those of us that listen rather than read, because basically right. I would have been waiting for the movie to come out. Thank you, Joel. And there's one on the way, I bet. There's one on the way. There's, and if there's not, doggone it, there should be, right? All right. Well, I, I'm the, I, I read it myself, uh, and I, I cry a few times, so be ready for that. Oh, no, man. Thanks, Joel. Joel. <laughs> well, we've been talking once again with Joel Manby. You can learn more at joelmanby.com, J-O-E-L-M-A-N-B-Y.com. You can also check out the Orange nonprofit at thinkorange.com. Joel, thanks so much. Yep. Yeah, Thank you, Joel. So Thank you, Joel. Enrique, Greg, Pleasure so meeting you. I appreciate it. It's been a blast. Yep. Yeah. Also, likewise. big thanks to my co-host here today. What a great conversation. Uh, Enrique with Vector Global Logistics. Thanks so much, Enrique Alvarez. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Greg. It's always a pleasure uh, yeah. sharing this microphone with you guys. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate you sharing, bringing these stories to us. These are inspirational. So. Yeah. This we love gold. this series. As Greg this texted me earlier, this is this is sheer gold, and this hour <laughs> spent has been because it's been great. So, uh, Greg White, always a pleasure. I uh, appreciate all of your constant leadership and advocacy, and these are great conversations to co-host with you. To our listeners, hey, if you enjoyed today's conversa conversation, check us out at supplychainnowradio.com. You can find the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. As we always challenge ourselves and the audience, hey, do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.